Uh, now going to uh, spend about half an hour um, talking about the details of the wave uh, data model and, and how the, the sort of the various layers of abstraction that we have. Um, this will both help you understand how wave works the system and also if you dive into the code uh, what some of the various things are doing in there. Um, I think uh, the the uh, Chen Yun time zone is catching up with me, so I'm sorry if my voice is uh, starting to go. Um, but I'll uh, stand in the microphone. Can everyone still hear me okay uh, up the back of the room at the moment? Yeah, nods, all right. What's up? All right, don't, uh, don't give us the feedback. All right, so I'm going to do it in a kind of bottom-up way. I'm going to start at the bottom with uh, sort of the most basic uh, components and build up the uh, layers of abstraction um, so you can see where we're going. Uh, so to start with, uh, you won't see anything to do with, uh, well, the word blip won't appear for quite a while. Um, and that's, uh, that's a good thing. Okay, so wave documents you're probably uh, um, at least roughly familiar with. So a wave document is a uh, structured, uh, structured rich text document. We use an XML-like tree structure for the, um, the the content of the document. If you uh, look at uh, a document in sort of one of our debug outputs or something, um, it looks very much like XML. It's it's probably a subset of XML. You could probably parse it with an XML XML parser. It's not strictly XML in that we don't. It doesn't conform to uh, various XML standards. And there's lots of stuff you can put in XML that you can't put in Wave documents. Um, and the reason, it looks like XML because that's very convenient. It maps nicely to a browser DOM for rendering. Um, uh, but lots of the, uh, the the way data is represented in Wave is very much governed by its need to behave well under operational transform. And so arbitrary XML doesn't behave well under operational transform. It's difficult to get uh, concurrent behavior to resolve nicely. And so we arrived at the structure that, uh, that I'll be talking about after a sort of number of iterations of different uh, uh, different models. To, to, to arrive at one that uh, sort of uh, preserves intent naturally under operational transform. Uh, so we use an XML tree-like structure for the, the, uh, the structural content, and then we have uh, standoff annotations for uh, styling information and metadata about the document. Um, and so these are not something that you find in XML, um, and they don't, they're not part of the structure of the document. Um, so I'll talk about each of these in a, in a bit of detail. The document structure here, this is what um, a document that's representing a, a blip, a message, looks like inside uh, Wave. Um, so you can see it's tree structured with a, a body as kind of a, a top level tag. Uh, we have line tags and gadget tags and there's a few other tags that you can find inside a, a blip document. Um, we have schemas that define what can go in here, but the schemas is one item of um, a Wave starter model that needs a lot of work. Um, the schemas are not currently enforced in Wave in a box, um, and they're currently represented in Java code rather than in any kind of declarative uh, in declarative way. <clears throat> and so uh, schemas is something we have some d time for discussion later on in the week about uh, what we should be doing with schemas and you know, how we can do it better. But anyway, so this is an example uh, Wave document. Um, it looks like XML, but it's not exactly like XML. Can anyone spot anything that's a bit weird about this document that you wouldn't do uh, naively? Yeah, so the, on the, uh, you're right, on the second and third lines, um, the content, the words wave summit and uh, who's coming to the summit are not nested inside the line elements. It's after the end of the line element. Uh, and that's an arrangement we arrived at uh, after a bit of experimentation and, uh, and lots of code. Um, and the reason we, reason we do that is uh, for operational transform. Uh, so it turns out to be very, very difficult to build operation components and uh, write correct intention-preserving transformation code um, if you put the content inside the line element. If uh, two people concurrently on different computers, you know, on the other side of the world, um, both hit carriage return inside this uh, nested element, you need to sort of... Uh, so, so you're probably familiar with HTML if you hit so your carriage return inside uh, inside a, a P element in HTML. What you want is... is uh, basically to insert a slash P and then a P at uh, the point where you hit carriage return, so you then have two paragraphs. Uh, if two people do that concurrently inside uh, the same paragraph, that's not too hard to resolve. Um, if someone presses backspace over one of those sort of breaks, you want the paragraphs to merge. Um, it becomes a bit trickier to resolve with someone also splitting it at the same point or a different point. Uh, and we also uh, uh, 
want to be able to undo these operations, have inverts, invert, in, uh, inversions of all these operations so you can uh, undo your changes when you're doing things. Um, and so the, the, the uh, operational transform code to handle this kind of thing uh, blew out, and we never correctly <laughs> implemented it, despite uh, a lot of trying. Uh, until eventually we decided, oh, if we just put the text outside of the line elements, the problem goes away. Now if two people uh, on this line here want to break the line at two different points, you just, you know, here and here concurrently, they can insert the a line slash line pair and a line slash line pair here, and that's just a really easy transformation. It's just two insertions. Um, and there's no sort of, com and if someone else is, is backspacing over them, it all just uh, resolves nicely. Um, and so we can write it correctly. We can uh, um, do lots of testing to sort of, um, almost prove. In, it, we should be able to theoretically prove it, but we don't have a mathematical proof that all of the transform is correct. Um, uh, so that, that's one example uh, of sort of an unnatural... It, it doesn't look like the way you would na naively represent it in XML, but it behaves much, much better under operational transform. Oh, sorry, and again, please uh, stick your hand up if you have any questions throughout, throughout uh, this talk, yeah. Ah, we've thought about it, and there's a few different uh, ways you can think about embedding tables in Wave. It is work that we sort of had underway. I think actually Dan might have dumped a bunch of the code that was halfway to do it. He's, he's, he was about to. We, we, we'd got a bit of a way towards implementing it. Um, I think there probably isn't, but I think we were trying to, uh, to dig it out. It, it wasn't fully functional, but we'd started putting some of the building blocks in place. Um, sorry, the question for the, the rest of the internet was uh, whether there's any support for tables. Um, and that's another good example of the, a data model that doesn't just map directly into Wave. If you just put an HTML table inside Wave, the transform of people adding rows and columns to the table is, is horrible. Um, um, but we do have a sort of more um, uh, indirect mechanism of doing it, um, and we were working towards that. Yeah. Uh, the qu question was, that, is there any way to support uh, video or images? So we have uh, basic embedding of, of images. Um, so there's an image thumbnail, there's an image tag, which works a bit like an image tag in HTML. It refers to, uh, um, or refers to an attachment ID or a URL. There's both. There's one that refers to a URL for an image like an HTML tag, and there's one that refers, excuse me, to an image that's attached to a wave as an attachment. Um, if you saw the wave demo, you can sort of drop photos in uh, in a wave, and they're sort of attached to it, like email attachments are, and you can refer to them from a, an element inside the wave as well. Uh, video, uh, again, not not natively, but by embedding a um, um, oh, I can't remember what the tag name is, uh, a gadget, I guess. You can embed a YouTube video inside a wave by just embedding a, a, a YouTube gadget inside the wave. That doesn't actually put the video content inside the wave, but it refers to it in the same way that you'd embed it in an HTML page. Okay. So, what you don't find in the uh, the XML style content is uh, um, style and markups, uh, style kind of markup. Um, so, if we Wave, of course, supports colors and fonts and headings and all that kind of stuff, um, but we don't do it um, like a naive HTML uh, would do it. Uh, the problem, of course, uh, again, it doesn't play well with operational transform. If you have nested pairs of tags. You want to nest a bold inside a, a font tag, and someone hits carriage return in the middle. You've now got uh, a double the hardest problem to split them out um, and resolve concurrently. Uh, and of course, it's just ugly when you have to uh, munge the uh, structure of your document to represent the fact that various styled regions overlap, um, which is of course how you'd end up doing it in, in you know, naive HTML before CSS. Um, so instead, we use uh, standoff annotations, and an annotation sort of paints a region of the document with a key value pair. And so uh, down the bottom here, I've tried to represent what it looks like. So not represented inside the content, of the, inside the tree content of the document, but in a separate data structure held next to it, is a set of uh, key value pairs and a region of the document that they span, a, a non-empty region of the document. Uh, so here, and, and annotations can overlap perfectly fine. You can have as many annotations over some element as you like. Um, uh, and, and the operational transform um, is very easy to uh, 
get to work. For most cases, there's, a, there's an edge case that uh, is a bit difficult that we've only recently fixed. Um, right, so, so they can overlap. So font styles, colors, head, uh, uh, not heading types. Heading types are represented as attributes on a, an element. Um, and, and things like the spelling, uh, when a region is misspelled, the spelling agent goes and annotates that region with uh, uh, an indication that it's been misspelled on a pointer to uh, some corrections. Question? Oh, um, there's a dodgy case when you're deleting at the end of an annotated region and someone else is deleting or inserting. It was quite uh, contrived and it took a long time for us to discover it um, through lots and lots of randomized testing. Um, I posted a bug about it recently uh, on our bug tracker, but that probably didn't give you quite enough information. Um, Suffice to say, it was a, it was a, a case deep in, in transform, uh, something to do with deleting annotated regions. Okay, so structure and annotations separately, uh, doing each doing what it's good at doing, and then each transforms fairly naturally. Um, okay, I think I went over this. So they paint the, they paint the structural content. Yeah, a good way of thinking about it is is a key value pair that's painting some region. Uh, so if you delete delete the painted region, the annotation is gone, there's nothing for it to paint. If you insert uh, uh, content in the middle of an annotated region, it is also annotated. It just naturally uh, keeps its annotation. Um, if you, uh, and, and it behaves uh, extremely well concurrently. If you, uh, if there's a paragraph and someone's typing in the middle of it and you select the whole paragraph and hit bold, um, then not only does the paragraph turn bold, but all the characters that they typed, even if they're on the wire somewhere, they've already typed them, they still end up bold in the, uh, the document as it comes out, um, thanks to the transform. Um, they also, uh, we have an inheriting uh, scheme for annotations. Um, so if there's a region of text that has some annotation and you insert another character at the very end of that region, it inherits the annotation of the uh, item to its left, all the annotations. So again, if you're uh, again, this is a, a bit of a trade-off, but the uh, the good side of the trade-off is that if you're typing at the end of a paragraph that's styled with some font, you don't have to keep sending the same annotations with each character. You just send the characters that you're sending, and they naturally inherit the annotation values from the uh, the character to their left. Um, questions? Okay. Um, you should, it's certainly on Google Wave, you can get a look at the, oh, sorry, on Wave Sandbox, you can get a look at the uh, annotations and structure of a document uh, by looking at the editor debug uh, menu. I think it's only visible on Wave Sandbox. Um, and that shows you some of the content of what your blip documents look like. Uh, so just briefly then on the operations, much of this has been covered in uh, other talks at, at, at uh, the various Google IOs and so on. So I'm not gonna go too deeply into uh, the operations and their transform. But uh, in brief, an operation is a, a function of document states. It transforms a document from one state to the next. Um, an operation is structured as a sequence of components. So the, the operation streams over the document and applies mutations to the document as it streams over it. Uh, so the basic mutation is retain, which is to not mutate. Um, so you can sort of retain a bunch of characters that are already in the document as they are. Then you can insert and delete characters, insert and delete uh, elements, the uh, what you know as HTML tags, start and end, and of course by the end of the annotation, by a whole operation has to preserve the uh, uh, the nesting of the the well formedness of the uh, the structure. Um, update and, and replace attributes on on elements. So an element like uh, a line element can have an attribute on it. So for example, headings are represented by uh, an attribute that's placed on the line element, and then that marks that whole uh, line as a heading. Much the same way as you might have a yeah heading tag, and uh, ra rather than have a, a dedicated tag, it's just a type of line. And then annotation boundaries. So annotation boundaries just uh, say, you know, at this point, this key becomes this value, and then at some point there needs to be another annotation boundary that says, all right, this annotation is ended, and that defines a, a painted region. Um, so graphically then down the bottom here, these two operations. Um, the way to interpret this, di this uh, graphic <laughs> is that e each horizontal line is a document state. So the document starts out in this in this in a state represented by this line. And the operation is the space between the horizontal lines. And so a white box here is just a retain component that says just keep this bit of the document as is. 
Then a red component is a uh, some deletion, a deletion of either uh, uh, characters or uh, or elements. And so you can see this this uh, region collapses out of the document when this operation is applied. Then over here, this green triangle triangle is an insertion component. And so as this this component of the operation is applied, uh, content is inserted in the middle. Uh, and so then this uh, diagram shows two operations. So you can see two operations can take the document through uh, a series of states. And you know the components can overlap, and here part of the inserted content is deleted in the next uh, the next component of the operation. Um, uh, wave operations are composable, which means uh, for any pair of operations like this, you can collapse them into uh, one operation, which represents the same uh, mutation, uh, and then outwards to any number of operations. They can all be collapsed, composed into uh, one operation on on a, in the domain of a single document. Um, and then this is a, this is how we represent our documents. Um, you know, on disk, the the structure of a do, the, uh, the the data in a document is purely defined as a sequence of operations that mutate the empty document into some state. Um, operations are also invertible. So for any operation, you can compute uh, an operation that does has the opposite effect when applied to uh, a document that's sort of in a state after the first one. Uh, you can make that computation without reference to the document. You only need an operation to be able to com compute its inverse. You don't need reference to the document it applies to. Um, uh, and, they com and they transform. So these three, import three important properties, they are composable, uh, invertible, and they transform against each other, which means the server is able to uh, uh, compute intention-preserving, uh, resolve intention-preserving changes to uh, operations co committed by different clients at uh, different points in the document. But uh, if you want more uh, detail about operations, uh, perhaps chat to one of us later, or uh, have a look at some of the Google I/O uh, talks from, uh, um, I guess the 2009 ones will probably have the most detail, and there's some other videos on YouTube as well describing this. But any questions? All right, awesome. Okay, so if we jump up a level, um, we get to wavelets. A wavelet is a collection of documents and a collection of participants who are participating on that collection of documents. Um, let's go from the top. So uh, <clears throat> a wavelet has a, an ID. Well, it has two IDs, a wave ID um, and a wavelet ID. Both of these have the form of some domain which hosts, uh, hosts, hosts the thing, and then some unique uh, pseudo-random part unique, that uniquely identifies it. Uh, and the wavelet has uh, two IDs, one which identifies the wave it's in, and one which identifies it within the wavelet. Um, then it has a bunch of participants. All the participants um, share the wavelet uh, equally in uh, the naive, naive case. So if you are a participant on a wavelet, you can view and mutate anything in the wavelet. Uh, access control is something we build on top of this layer. It's then just a bag of documents. The documents have identifiers. Um, the identifiers are frequently structured. So there's a special document that's named conversation, which I'll talk about a bit later. There's documents. Each, each message in a wave conversation is backed by one document. Um, there's also other documents that implement other sort of uh, aspects of a conversational wave, like the tags that are applied to it. Um, so these are all represented inside documents. They're all mutated by document ops. They're not special things in the protocol. Everything is just wavelets, which are bags of documents. Um, so the two uh, operations that apply to a wavelet are um, to add and remove participants, and then to just apply an operation to some document that's part of the wavelet. Um, and, that, and so wavelets have nothing else that's uh, special. Questions? Cool. OK, a wave then. Uh, finally, we're up to the level where we can talk about what a wave is. Um, it's nothing more than a collection of, of wavelets. Um, it's not a collection that's explicitly stored anywhere. It's simply the set of wavelets that share a wave ID. So a wave is added. Uh, a wavelet is added to a wave simply by giving it uh, a wave ID of that wave. Um, and this means that a wave is not necessarily hosted even on one uh, service provider. So uh, we could have a wave on acmewave.com, and someone else on uh, the federated wavesandbox.com could add a wavelet to that wave, perhaps representing a private reply. Uh, and only add wavesandbox.com participants to that wavelet. And Acme Wave would never see that wavelet. 
it's still logically part of the wave, but Acme Wave only has a partial view of it in this case. Um, I mean, so the, but so that the data of that private reply on Wave Sandbox never travels across, you know, the internet to Acme Wave. You don't even need to trust Acme Wave uh, at all um, to be able to have a wave, uh, a wavelet that's part of that wave. Yeah, question. That's right. Um, the only reason it would find out is if someone who does know that it exists adds an Acme Wave participant, and then uh, the Wave Sandbox on the Wave Sandbox server will tell Acme Wave that the wavelet exists and it should go and fetch the data. Um, but normally, outside of Federation, uh, you know, most of the wavelets in a wave are hosted on one machine, and you can just sort of do a scan of the data store or so on to discover which wavelets are part of the same wave. Okay, so then we have the also con uh, concept that's uh, not stored anywhere, but represented in a, in a running wave system, which is a wave view, and that's one one user's one client's uh, view of the wavelets in a wave that it participates on. So a wave might have a bundle of wavelets. Some of them might be shared by lots of people. Some of them might might be private wavelets that has only one participant. A client's view is the wavelets where that that client's uh, you know address participates on that wave. Um, and so in the, in, in, the, in the code, it's the uh, client front end which computes a client's view. It, it has access to the wave bus and sees all the wavelets. It computes a client's view and sends only the, uh, the deltas that are in view to a particular client. Any questions? Cool, cool. All right, so what I've described up till now is what we think of as the... Uh, the core, the, the, the uh, sort of the core of Wave. It's a uh, attempt to, to be uh, an application agnostic tool tool bag of you know concurrent documents with uh, participation upon which application models can be built. And the application model which everyone is familiar with is the conversation, which is of course the one it was originally designed for. So a conversation then is uh, an abstract data model that we embed in this in this. Uh, substrate of wavelets and documents. Um, so the way a conversation is represented is that there's one document per blip, so one document per conversational message. Um, there's another document which describes the 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 um, describes the, uh, yeah, the structure of the blips, which blips are replies to which, which blips are in which threads, and how those things are nested um, within the wavelet. And so it's described inside a document rather than being sort of represented uh, deep into the, the core. Um, and then private replies, I briefly discussed, uh, are separate wavelets. So a conversation might have a number of wavelets. Some of them will be conversational wavelets that everyone's participating on. Some of them will be uh, private user data wavelets that only new, normally only have one participant on them, and they contain sort of your metadata about the conversation. And some might be private replies, which are conversational but only shared with a subset of the participants. <clears throat> um, so I can talk a little bit about how that uh, nesting happens. Um, so there's a special document inside uh, each, each conversational wave called conversation, and here's an example of one, and it describes um, the, the nesting of, of threads and messages. So there's a, an implicit root thread in the conversation, and then this root thread has two blips, the one right at the top and the one right at the bottom, and then there's a reply to that first blip. Someone you know, in, in the wave client, they clicked, hit, 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 they clicked on the first blip and hit reply, and that spawns a new thread, and that thread has uh, two blips as well. It's uh, these two, and then this blip again has a reply, and there's, a, there's just a single single message inside that. Uh, I should really have had a slide that shows you what the wave panel looks like with this uh, conversation, but um, uh, but I didn't do that. Um, so the model is 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 the, is the uh, conversation is a thread. And a thread has a number of blips, and each blip can have threads, and a thread has blips, and so on, mutually recursively. Um, and that gives us that gives us the threaded conversations that uh, that uh, make a part of what makes Wave uh, useful. Uh, so uh, the flow then to uh, when you hit you know reply in your Wave client, um, your Wave client uh, first goes and sticks in some uh, a um, you know a body tag and an empty line in some new document that it invents. It picks a new document ID and sticks an empty line in it. And then it comes along to the conversation manifest and sticks a new entry in the right point here describing where that new blip appears in the conversational structure. Um, and, and, so the, and then the reverse process, when someone else, when, when some other client receives those mutations, 
Um, it sees an empty line appear in some new document ID, but it doesn't know what that is yet. And then it sees uh, an entry appear in the conversation manifest and knows, ah, there's a new blip, and, and renders it, and then goes and looks up that document for the content. Um, <clears throat> okay, any questions about this so far? Yes? Ah, I don't have any uh, um, one on screen, but I can describe how that's uh, represented as well. Um, so a, a private uh, uh, private reply is another wavelet. It has its own conversation document like this that describes the structure of its conversation. Um, the difference being that the, the uh, conversation element, the sort of the top level element of its uh, manifest, also describes a point in the parent conversation where it's uh, embedded. Um, so our current Code. Our current code, I think, describes the the, the message that it's uh, in a reply to. So you identify a blip ID of the uh, reply, but I don't think it uh, appropriately yet describes <clears throat> uh, where. So you can do. Oh, we can't do inline replies. That's right. You can't do inline private private replies yet. Um, right. So so as attributes on the conversation element, there is a reply wavelet ID which says this this wavelet is a private reply to some other wavelet and then a reply blip ID which says and within that wavelet the blip with this identifier is the one that this is a reply to. Um, so each each uh, private reply wavelet is, is its own wavelet, has its own manifest describing the layout of, of blips and references by name where it should appear in its parent conversation. This has the effect that uh, there's no trace of the private reply in the parent conversation. Someone who doesn't participate on it cannot know that it exists, let alone see the content. Yeah. How do you identify where it goes? Um just by identifier. So it's it's uh, a private reply is always in, in reply to some uh, uh, some blip. So that blip has an ID and we just name that ID in this way let's conversation manifest. At the moment we can't describe it with any more precision than in reply to this message. Does that make sense? Not quite. Let's start uh, chatting at it again later. Yeah. Ah, do you know the stats, Soren? It was pretty small. Um, It probably uh, scaled a bit with your sort of, I don't know, how happy you were. You, you te technically uh, savvy. It was not the most discoverable feature, um, and it, uh, it was not immediately obvious how they worked either. So. People were just dipping their toes in the way the prime anyway. So. So they were not widely used. Um, I don't think Wave in a Box supports them right now, but you know we'll work towards it. It didn't seem like a blocker for us uh, having something working. Yeah. Yeah. The question was, uh, if the private reply references a blip and the blip is deleted, what happens? The private reply is basically uh, orphaned. The the client picks somewhere to attach it. You know, probably at the very bottom of the wave or something. Um, it's still there, but we don't know where to point it anymore. That's, I guess, a trade-off of the fact that there's no trace of it in the parent wave. It is that. The, someone who doesn't know about its existence can't can't fix that up. What's next? Ah, oh, okay. So the conversation is one uh, one of these models that we embed on top of the uh, the wave core model. Um, other things that we embed tags. Uh, so in Google Wave, each wave has a bunch of tags. Tags are, are shared. Um, the tags are just represented in another, another document inside the wavelet. The, the document's called tags. Um, and it's just basically, it looks like a list of, of XML, uh, XML structure elements called tag uh, with, a, um, with a value that's the, uh, the value of the tag. So we, we uh, represent this list of you know, arbitrary data that's attached to a conversation just in another document. Uh, per user data, so every, uh, uh, on Google Wave, I don't know if they're live on Wave in a box yet. I don't know if it's quite been hooked up yet. Um, each user has a bunch of data about their interaction with a wave. 
So when you view a wave, we keep track of you know which messages you have viewed. So when you come back, you can see uh, you know a green line marking messages that are new since last time you looked at it. Um, um, and we, we can track when you hit, hit the archive button to make the wave go away until it you know is changed again, or when you put it in a folder. All of that is sort of information that's only that's private to you. It's your interaction with the wave. It's not shared with other people. Um, but we also store that in a, in, a, in wave. And so the way that works is there's another wavelet which we call your user data wavelet. Um, it has an ID which uh, includes your your address. So it's sort of you can you can uh, the the ID is, is well known to you, so you can look it up. Um, you are the only participant on it, so it just never gets sent to other clients at all. It's not in their view. It never gets federated because there's no uh, no one from federated servers who participates in it. Um, and so we represent uh, folders and the red state and uh, which things you've seen in red, um, which thing, and you can you know, mark things as unread. Whether you've got something in a folder or so on, all inside data structures that are embedded inside <coughs> another wavelet inside the wave that only you can see. Um, so I'm not going to show you all of the, the ways they're, they're variously embedded. Um, there's code, uh, there's code which is in the in the repository, which describes ways to embed basic data structures like lists and maps inside Wave documents. And Dave Herndon is going to talk about that um, on Wednesday morning, I think. Uh, a bit more about how you can embed your own data structures inside Wave's uh, document model. Uh, folders, archive, follow. Yeah, okay. So all of those things. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the question was if you have uh, hundreds of thousands, excuse me, hundreds of thousands of people all, all watching the same wave, does the sort of state on the server grow to, uh, you know, in scale with that? And the answer is yes. Each of them ends up with a user data wavelet. They're normally pretty small. It's like a couple of documents. But but yes, it grows. Um, if you, of course, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. If you didn't have that, I'm not trying to excuse it, but if you didn't have that, of course, you would be storing the data in some other data store somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question was, can, can federation be used to sort of spread that spread that load a bit? Um, and the answer is is uh, yes, at least in a way. Um, if you have a a wave and it has lots of participants from other federated servers on it, um, the server hosting the conversational wavelet doesn't host their user data. Their own wave servers host it. Um, their own user data wavelets are never federated never federated with uh, you. Because uh, no one uses on your server participate. So if you if you have lots of federated users, um, then yeah, their own service providers host their own user data. Um, so that does split it a bit. So note that the different wavelets within the same wave are not uh, sort of a transaction or a unit or something like that. So they don't need to be hosted uh, by the same. Um, a server, if you have a, a multi-server uh, data store, uh, then you can choose to sort of shard uh, this so that uh, the user data is uh, a user data wavelet is, is hosted on another machine than the, the conversation wavelet that it uh, belongs to. So uh, uh, you would uh, you would want to put a, a, a one wavelet. Uh, in, in this in, in one place because it's one transactional unit but uh, the many wave so the many use data wavelets in one wave they are all different wavelets and you can uh, choose to have them hosted in uh, on different uh, storage backends <coughs> storage for a single wave, you lose one node which takes out a couple of wavelets. 
all of a sudden you're missing the playbooks and you throw errors, mm -hmm. throwing errors in. You don't, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. So, so they should all be sitting in the ship set. So, you so, data more than one machine. More than one so, so the, the, the architectural issue that's outside of the scope of, of the design of Wave. Well, Waves at the moment is essential as store uh, at one canonical server for a federated Wave. Uh, well, the the Raven in a box is, is just yeah. the, that code is written to only work on one server. But the core concepts don't require that everything be on one physical server. I, Google's uh, hosting their Wave on more than one server. Uh, yeah, so. Um, I think uh, we're sort of progressing off the topic here, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to explain uh, uh, how we uh, organize that. <clears throat> yeah, our machines fall over all the time, and uh, obviously we didn't <laughs> didn't lose too much data. Um, right. Okay. Now I'm going to talk. So that's that's the uh, the concepts we had uh, right at the bottom. Documents which are mutated by operations. Oh, sorry. Question. Yeah. The conversation is the main one. These sort of metadata type, mod type models that are related to the conversation are another one. Um, we've explored a few other ones, but didn't sort of uh, get them done. In, in some, there's some things that the wave model is not good for, and there's some that it is good for. Um, yeah, so tables don't. Uh, so, so I mean, spreadsheets like a table. We definitely went through a lot of conceptual thinking about it, but you know, it didn't. Uh, it wasn't. We didn't implement anything. Um, so, yeah, a table structure looks unnatural. Uh, Inside a wave, but but you, it still ends up being very highly concurrent and so on. Um, we have good sort of best practices for embedding data structures that we sort of developed and hope to communicate with you uh, over these uh, the next few days. Um, but I can't point to anything else concrete. Ah, suggest wavelets. So people even know how they are supposed to work. Yeah, okay. Yep, sure, okay. Uh, so on Google Wave, when you uh, type a new, you know, start a new wave, um, type some content and so on, and then hit the Add Participant button, uh, Google Wave tries to be very smart about who appears at the top of that list by analyzing the content and content you've shared with other users inside Wave. Um, and the way it communicates to you what the participant suggestion should be um, is through another wavelet. There's another wavelet in the Wave that has a ranked ordering of uh, participants. Per user? Uh, per, yes, per user. So it's inside your user data wavelet, so no one else sees your suggestions. <clears throat> um, I, another, another one which occurs to me is uh, spell corrections. So when you have a spell uh, each uh, inside the conversation, uh, there's another document that uh, our spelling agent writes, which has uh, a bunch of um, it has one entry per misspelled word in the uh, in the conversational content. In the conversational content, the, uh, the spelling agent annotates a misspelled region and gives it some ID, which is a lookup into the uh, corresponding spell document. And then that contains a, you know, you know, a list of um, suggestions with you know, rank ordering and, and scores and so on. Oh, yeah, attachments is another one. So an attachment, uh, like an image that you attach to a wave, the actual binary data is, is you know, you're a blob store somewhere. But um, the metadata describing it is in another document. Well, these, these are all what we call data documents. So documents that are not blip documents, we tend to call data documents. And that has a sort of a, a record structure embedded in it that describes the file name, um, the percentage that's uploaded. So that sort of live updates as the attachment uploads, um, the, the MIME type and stuff like that. So, so very simple sort of record structures are very easy to embed. Yes? So right now, Wave in a Box lacks that. Um, that uh, the question was, how can users of Wave in a Box have things like Spelly that sort of act on all waves? Um, right now, Wave in a Box doesn't have that functionality. Someone mentioned earlier, I think it was James, um, that there was this agents concept in sort of the early versions that we've been taking out. Uh, it was it was not not well implemented. Um, so an agent like Spelly uh, sits on the Wave bus. In Wave in a Box, this is all inside one process. In Google Wave, the Wave bus was actually on the wire, and everything that was in that original box was on separate machines. Um, 
Uh, so the answer is to expose something like the wave bus as a you know as a network level interface, um, and then build some let's call them agents which uh, respond respond to that wave bus and receive all the data and they're trusted components of your system. They're not things that you let people on the internet hook up to. Um, uh, so wave in a box lacks that at the moment. It's um, we we need to sort of uh, we need to rethink how we can expose a wave bus appropriately in, in wave in a box. But it's sort of it's a little bit beyond our goals of in a box because once we're doing that, it's it's not it, it's starting to become a distributed system. It's something we want to look at after we get the core thing working. Um, so we haven't you know done it yet. So right now you could do it by coding it into the box, wave in a box, um, but that's you know that's going to be not not a winning game if we do it too many too often and have too much stuff running inside there. Um, so so really the right solution is to once we have sort of wave in a box working and decide we need to expand it to split out some kind of wave bus interface over the network and then have agent like components. Re basically rebuild your agents API. Like the wave bus box. Possibly yeah. I mean our <clears throat> Yeah, when I mean, we had a library that sort of managed that kind of stuff, um, we'd probably do it again rather than try and open source yeah. the code. It wasn't brilliant. Um, <clears throat> I've got another question. I, yeah. I'm really curious. Uh, I mentioned it in the context of the uh, issue you guys ran into with challenges with uh, uh, a line, you know, having to do the line, line, slash line. Yeah. Uh, the question was, um, would there be a problem? Or, or, so, in the context of my earlier talking about uh, lines and so on, um, if you were trying to type XML into a wave, so XML on top of XML, would you run into sort of concurrency problems? Um, probably not. What you wouldn't have is a guarantee that the, the XML is always well formed. Wave documents never end up in an ill formed state. There's, you can't apply an operation that breaks the nesting, for example. And it was maintaining that kind of, uh, those kind of guarantees that were hard. If you're just typing XML into a document, it's not always in a well-formed state. If you're, you know, typing, and people can be typing all over the document, and that's that's fine. It would work fine. So I guess the follow-up then is, um, you know, future iteration or an experiment or iteration of the wave should be have to have that uh, restriction of having to have XML formatting. Oh. Uh, the question was, should do we uh, could we have a version of wave that doesn't have the restriction of being uh, well-formed all the time? That would be tricky. That requires uh, deep thought. Um, there's that, that, that's, I mean, so that's built very deep into the core of Wave that uh, these documents are, are well formed. Um, off the top of my head, it would be a different system if it wasn't. But um, it's an interesting thing to think about. I haven't thought about it. Are there any other questions while we're here? All right, these are good questions. I like it. Any models we're thinking of adding? Off the top of my head, no. But it's the kind of thing where the code is out. There's enough code out there now that you can uh, you can write your own. Oh, yeah, settings was another one. Per user settings was a, so you, you could turn Spelly on or off or um, set up email notifications and so on. That was also. Was that a bunch of data documents? Yeah, that was a separate wave. That was your settings wave and a bunch of data documents. Uh, yeah. So, so currently, the, uh, the the digest, the search results, your inbox is, is, is um, well. Let's not talk about how it is currently. Even in a, a couple of weeks' time, is going to be um, um, you're an RPC. You use the data API, so it's basically a request response kind of model. Something we've thought about for a long time is is just putting that in a wave. So you uh, open a wave, <coughs> and the server fills in your inbox in, by embedding it in that wave. Um, and so then that sort of gets rid of another 
the advantages of doing that is it gets rid of a, um, you know, you can get rid of a servlet out of the server. You can get rid of having you, you, any problems with uh, going offline or resynchronizing as the wave box, uh, sorry, as the, as the inbox. Uh, if we want to have a live inbox so the results appear automatically, you have to invent uh, a new scheme to resolve the uh, resolve the concurrent nature of that. You know, you can archive something and meanwhile something appears. Uh, you know, and th those uh, need to be resolved concurrently. You know, Wave just does that for you, so you get to reuse all of that. You can reuse the handling of the connection going offline and coming back online and reconnecting and so on. Um, so the inbox is one example that we've thought of where we would like to embed it in a Wave. Um, and in fact, we have a design for it, which I've just been sitting on. I was, we, were, we were planning to do it, and then we thought, no, we'll do something simple first. Um, so perhaps I'll publish that design when I get a moment as an example of another thing that you can embed inside Wave. Yeah, that could work. Yeah. All right. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the structure of the code that represents these uh, concepts. So we've got documents that are uh, acted on by ops. We have wavelets, which are bundles of documents. Um, and then we have the wave, which is just this collection of, of wavelets. And then the abstract model is built on top of that. Um, so just uh, for those of you who are excuse me, going to be going to look inside the code for this, um, this is how some of the code modules are laid out. Uh, so documents first. There's a raw document down the bottom, which you almost never have to interact with. Um, that's a dumb data holder state. It has uh, not much smarts, um, but it's a it's a DOM, it's a tree structure thing, um, very much like an HTML DOM or something. That's sort of your raw document state, and it's mutated by you know a, a DOM style API, create child and stuff like that. Um, you almost never have to talk to that. You just need to know it's there. Um, and then this has two implementations. There's an implementation in the uh, in the web client, which has a lot of links into the uh, parallel HTML DOM. And so as waves change, uh, as operations are applied and this document mutates, the uh, the editor and rendering engine mutate the HTML DOM um, in parallel. And there's another implementation for uh, non-browser environments, for, for server-side environments. It just doesn't have those, those kind of links. And then uh, most of the smarts is in index document. Um, index document maintains a... Um, a tree index over the uh, structure of this raw document, so it can very efficiently jump to particular locations. It doesn't need to do a tree traversal; it can uh, it can jump to particular locations very fast. Um, and so it is what ops apply to. Ops uh, are passed into the index document, and remember, an op is a sequence of these mutations. Um, it's the index document that deconstructs that, jumps to the right places in the raw document, and applies the applies the mutations. It does the uh, consistency checking, schema checking, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, events pop out of the index document as it's changed. So a full operation applies, and then an event pops out of the index document uh, describing what changed uh, as part of that operation. Uh, then sitting on top of that is what we call the mutable document. There's a couple of different classes with uh, various flavors of mutable document. Um, and these are the ones that you will commonly interact with in code if you're building a data model on top of a wave or something. And that presents you a sort of a user-friendly um, uh, um, mutation API, so you can create children and insert text and so on. Um, it's, a, it's, it's not dissimilar to this API, um, but uh, and the mutable document then generates ops. Its job is to take your uh, programmatic mutations and generate an op that describes that, and then apply it to the mutable document that's beneath it. Um, and the reason we go through that sort of programmatic and then an op and then programmatic again is because these ops. Uh, you know what Wave is built on, and they're the ops we need to send to all the other send to the Wave server. So, um, uh, as an op is applied to this index document, it's applied to the local state. It's also sent out to the remote server. So exactly the same op is applied uh, in both places. Um, and then the events that come out of the index document bubble out of the mutable document as well. And if you're uh, again writing a data structure, you need to watch what happens to the document that's representing your data structure as other people change it. So that's uh, a very basic layout of the uh, the document uh, end of the code. Generally, you'll be interacting with um, some interface around a mutable document. Yes? When you're having keystrokes, um, do you do every keystroke, or do you have to find a few keystrokes to transfer an or do you find an adapting operation? Um, the, uh, the bundling is done somewhere slightly different. 
The keystrokes all are immediately, immediately applied to the local document and uh, produce an operation, you know, at least as fast as the browser scheduler lets us do it. Um, but then we don't send out an op immediately. Um, they get bundled up so that we have just one outstanding request to the server at a time. So we send out an op, and then while we're waiting for the response from the server, we compose any other ops that are applied to that document. And when we finally get our response, we send that composed bundle off as the next, uh, the next network transaction. Um, so that, that uh, self-throttles according to the, uh, the network latency. If you have a high latency connection, you get lots of things composed into one, one, uh, one transmission. Oh, so this code would uh, be in, uh, if you're looking at the repository, it's like an org wave protocol wave model document and various sub packages of that. A wavelet then also has a similarly uh, three uh, three tiered architecture, although it's uh, wired up slightly differently. Um, so there's data down here, which includes the documents. It includes some metadata about uh, the wavelet, like you know the participants, uh, last modified timestamp, things like that. Um, I, again, the things that we call data are really dumb. They're just containers. They could almost be uh, program programmatically generated. You can represent them as a protocol buffer or something. There's no there's no smarts. Um, um, ops are applied to the data, um, well, ops apply themselves to the data um, uh, via an op executor. And the, only, and the reason we have this uh, sort of op executor out to the side is that, again, so we have symmetry with local operations and remote operations. Local operations are produced by other bits of code in, in, uh, running in your, compute, in your, uh, your client uh, and apply to this, del this data. And remote operations that the server, some other client has generated, sent to the server and are now being sent to you come in the same way and apply to the same data. Um, and what that, uh, yeah, I wonder which way I should describe this. Then as the data uh, mutates, events pop out. And this event stream propagates up uh, through the various layers of abstraction. So above this data layer, we have a uh, class called op-based wavelet and uh, op-based blip, um, although it shouldn't be called blip. Um, this layer here takes uh, programmatic mutations and builds ops that describe them and then applies them to the data upon which it sits. Um, so again, data is only ever mutated by operations and are not drawn here like it was not drawn in the other one. The ops that pop out of here are the ops that are sent off to the uh, remote, remote uh, uh, off to the server to be sent out to all the other clients. So again, um, the data is only ever operated on by ops and we have a, a um, ops from Local mutations and, and uh, remote uh, mutations follow the same code path once they've been created. And so the events that pop out of the data here come up through the op-based wavelet and then up to your application model, which is, so the application model might be the conversation model, um, which sits on top of an op-based wavelet and sort of interprets the op-based wavelet's data in a particular way. Um, and so events that pop out of here might be, you know, a new line was added to the uh, conversation document, and then that turns into, oh, a new blip was added to the conversation. It's an abstract abstract event. Um, so programmatic mutation, you know, append a blip to this thread, comes into the application model, it transforms it into something uh, that applies to the wavelet, you know, interprets that as a wavelet uh, mutation, applies it to its own data and sends the op off. If someone else somewhere, and some other client does the same thing, the op comes in here, applies here, then the op-based wavelet and the application model both uh, watch the events from their, their child and you know, update their own uh, in-memory state accordingly. Um, so it actually turns out to be very important to the building of application models that there's just one event stream up here uh, and all the sort of local state update is done in response to those events. So you only have to write the code once to uh, respond to something like a new blip being added. It's not different whether you added the blip or someone else added the blip, it's just a new blip was added. There was a question. Uh, so that's resolved by the server. So uh, whenever every operation that any client generates is sent to the wave server for that wavelet, um, they reach the servlet in that they reach the server in some order. The server picks an order. You know, they, they get there in some order. Whichever one gets there first goes first. Whichever one gets there second goes second, and then they come out of the server in that order. And so every everyone watching sees them in one particular order. The two clients who are actually part of the mutation. It's the operational transform code that resolves the fact that they their local state mutated at the same time as um, the server's canonical state. 
and the operational transform code, which I'm not, I'm not going to go into too much detail to, but I can point you to other talks that do, um, uh, transforms the operations at both ends so that the intent is preserved. So if you someone inserts some text and someone deletes some text earlier on in the document, you know the insert location moves back a bit in the transformed operation. It's the server, that, the, it's the operational transform code that computes that um, and resolves it at both ends. Yes, yes, yes. So that, yeah, good point. So this, this, there might have been you know, some that popped out of here. Some up was already coming in here. It's gone through the concurrency control stack and been transformed against this one, and will now apply correctly to the document state. So um, we can take this part offline if you want, but I want to figure out the ops that are coming in from the programmatic generation. Mm -hmm. Um, how do we ensure? So this is essentially uh, the, 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 these arrows, ignoring the remote op arrow, these arrows are synchronous. So this whole flow happens every time you push a key. Um, and so it's, it's uh, including it being sent off to transform. It'll really have to worry about so there's, it's, not, it's not concurrent in the multi-threaded sense um, inside any one client. Um, so you don't have to worry about that too much. The CC stack. Uh, Yes, that's right. Uh, apparently, the next one's my last slide. Oh, that's right. Um, okay, so building up now at the top of our um, um, bottom-up uh, talk, this is kind of an overview of the whole uh, the platform and, and how we think about uh, the way the Wave model supports uh, Wave. So at the very core here, we have uh, what I've been describing: uh, the Wave, the data, the core data model. Um, and the concurrency control and operational transform that allow it to be uh, live in real time. Then uh, <clears throat> on top of that, uh, we have things like the robot library, which sort of interface with robots. Um, and then various bits of the client, like the editor, which is you know the way that we let uh, humans interact in real time with these documents and can embed gadgets and so on. Um, so this platform is, is, is what we can build applications on. The platform is built on top of the core. And then the application, the most well-known application or application components is, you know, Google Wave or the Wave in a Box client. Um, but other application components can be built on top of this platform. So uh, attachments um, and robots, actual robots and so on, um, use this core to, ha to uh, have their own uh, real-time concurrent behavior. Um, over in the client, various things we mentioned were supported by Waves before, so profiles were represented in a, in a Wave in Google Wave. We haven't you know, done that in Wave in a Box yet. Settings was a Wave. Gadgets, state is stored in a Wave inside Wave documents. Um, the Wave panel is part of the application for you know, rendering a Wave to you. Uh, and over on this side, so linking and spell your application components that work well with conversational Wavelets. Um, Yes, question. Um, why the Yeah, I guess that's a bit arbitrary. Um, <laughs> you could build uh, other wave clients, but you'd still uh, want the editor. Um, although I guess it depends on what platform you're building them. That is somewhat arbitrary. We think of it as a reusable uh, component. It, it's self-contained. You could you could stick the editor in other non-wave applications, and it's good for that too. I guess that's why we that's why we think of it as part of the platform. I, excuse me, yeah, I believe so. Uh, I mean, it's probably a bit heavyweight for that example, but it would be capable of it. Please. So, so this uh, this diagram uh, was something we drew uh, when we had a bit of a crisis about how to um, uh, model certain things. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, but it still looks good um, and uh, supports the, the point I, uh, I'd like to make. Um, 
So we found out that uh, we were struggling with com uh, managing the complexity of all this, um, and uh, that, uh, and then we uh, came up with this diagram to uh, and uh, this, uh, decided that uh, a good um, uh, way to manage the complexity, both in terms of sort of uh, uh, the understanding and uh, discussing the concepts, and also in terms of implementation, was layering, and uh, so some of the most um, uh, subtle and finicky stuff is uh, uh, things to do with operational transformation and um, uh, the, uh, the the CC concurrency control um, uh, logic, uh, um, and um, so we wanted to uh, not let application stuff sort of seep in there. So we um, we've spent since we drew this diagram two years ago. We we spent all that time trying to take things out of uh, the core and simplifying it, removing operations, and, uh, uh, um, and uh, um, so the, the, uh, simplify the API down here. And so I, the reason why I bring it up was both that uh, this is uh, part of the story of, of this diagram that uh, uh, we found was a, a useful lesson we learned, but also uh, to uh, understand that when, uh, when we discuss uh, on the, uh, there have been discussions on the mailing list, and I hope we'll have a lot of discussions this week about uh, what uh, what we can do with uh, Wave and what we should add and what we should change. That uh, uh, we, we are, what we learned is that you should not uh, put extra features in here. You should uh, you make sure that these things are simple and that we uh, that they support um, uh, building uh, concepts uh, and applications on top of them. Uh, so, so we're very sort of purist about what uh, 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 what we call the core. So, um, I imagine that that will come up. Uh, yeah, thank you, Soren. So, we, we, I mean, uh, our goal, and we've been moderately successful, is to build a core that supports uh, many types of types of application models um, and allows them to take advantage of being real time and have concurrency resolved naturally for them. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, some of us feel very strongly about the simplicity of that core, and I'm sure that'll come out in, uh, in uh, various discussions. Um, so that's all I had. Um, are there more questions before I sort of uh, finish? I think we have a break next anyway, but uh, are there more questions? Okay, it looks like my voice is just about held out. So let's uh, go and have some tea and coffee and then chat. Five minute break.